So I'm going to revisit the activity selection uh, problem proof, proof of correctness. So I think the, the proof that we gave last time may not have been clear to some uh, people or many people in the class. So I think what was missing in the, in the way that the proof was presented is a high level, uh, a high level description of the relation between greedy choice, the greedy choice property, property, and the optimal substructure property. You know, what's the relation between the two and how, uh, how, they, uh, how are they used to, uh, to construct a proof? In fact, to construct a proof, but to construct an algorithm as well. So the idea is the following. I have a number of activities, A1, A2, A3, through AN. Without any loss of generality, these activities are sorted by, uh, by finish time in ascending order. So this A1 is the, the activity with the minimum finish time. So they are sorted. If they are not sorted, I, will, so I can sort them. Now, the greedy choice property means that there exists at least one optimal algorithm, uh, one optimal solution that starts with the greedy choice. What's the greedy choice? The greedy choice is the activity with the minimum finish time. So the greedy choice property in this context means there exists at least one optimal solution that starts with the greedy choice. And we have proven this. How did we prove this? Who can recall the proof? How did we prove that we proved that there exists at least one optimal solution that starts with the greedy choice? We proved this by considering an optimal solution that doesn't start with the greedy choice. So we said, OK, if we have an optimal solution that does not start with the greedy choice, I can take this O1 and replace it with A1. I can always replace it with A1. When I replace it with A1, this is going to be a valid solution because A1 finishes before O1, right? If A1 and A1 are, are not the same. So A1 finishes at least as early as O1, which means that it's not going to conflict with any of these. And the size of the solution is the same because I took one activity and replaced it with another activity. So the number of activities in the solution is still the same. Okay? So this proves that I can always start with the greedy choice. But it doesn't prove that I can continue. So in order to prove that I can continue, the idea is to prove that once I have made the greedy choice, once I have selected A1, now I have a remaining subproblem. I have a remaining subproblem. What is the remaining subproblem? The remaining subproblem is the problem of selecting the maximal subset out of the remaining activities, the ones that do not conflict with A1, by the way. So the ones that conflict with A1, I'm going to exclude them. So for example, suppose that A2 and A4 conflict with A1. So I'm going to exclude them because they conflict with A1. So out of the activities that do not conflict with A1, solve this problem like a, as if it was a separate problem or a standalone problem, like starting a new problem. Now, we proved that for this particular problem, which is the activity selection, I can take an optimal solution to this subproblem and stick it or combine it with the, the greedy choice and then construct a solution to the big problem. 
Now, in order to appreciate this, you have to see a problem for which uh, that does not satisfy the optimal substructure. A problem that uh, you cannot just take a, 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 an optimal solution to a subproblem and stick it to another optimal solution to another subproblem and then construct a, a, an optimal solution to the big problem. So we'll have to make this point. So this is the example that I will be giving. So consider this problem. Consider the longest path problem in graphs. The longest path, yes? Uh, I have a clarification question. So, so to prove that something can be solved by a greedy algorithm, does it need to only satisfy the greedy choice property, or does it need to satisfy both those properties? It has to satisfy both. So the greedy choice property tells you that your first choice can, the greedy, can be the greedy choice. But it doesn't tell you that you can continue the same way. You can continue doing the same thing repeatedly. In order to prove that you can continue to do the same thing repeatedly, you should prove that this remaining subproblem can be solved as if it were uh, you know, the, the original problem or a problem by itself. So you just ignore what you have, all the decisions that you have made, and you solve this like a standalone problem. And then whatever optimal solution you come up with for this, you stick it to this. But now how would you solve this? You would solve this by making the greedy choice again so maybe the greedy choice in this case is A3. So you make the greedy choice, and now you have a smaller remaining subproblem. Then you make another greedy choice, which could be, for example, A7. And now once you make the greedy choice for this remaining subproblem, you will end up with another yet another subproblem that is smaller. So you are by repeatedly making the greedy choice, you are left with smaller and smaller subproblems. And you can keep doing this repeatedly until you get to a subproblem that has not, that doesn't have any activities in it. Right? So the the optimal substructure is needed to prove that we can keep repeating. So let me to appreciate this, I think I need to give an example of a problem that does not satisfy the optimal substructure so that you you appreciate what, you know, what you understand what optimal substructure is and appreciate uh, why it's needed and why the activity selection problem is, uh, you know, satisfies the properties that are needed to solve it using greedy algorithms. So consider the longest path, longest path problem in graphs. So consider this graph. A, B, C, D, uh, E. This is a graph. Now the problem is finding the longest path between two vertices. We are given two vertices and we are uh, asked to find the, the longest path between these two vertices. Of course, we would like to find a simple path. What is a simple path? A simple path is a path in which you do not repeat vertices. A path in which you don't repeat vertices. Now, what's the longest path between uh, say uh, B and D between or let's say that the longest path between uh, yeah B and D what's that path so there are two paths between B and D there is a short path which is this and there is a longer path which is this Right? So the longest path between B and D is, is the path B, A, B, A, E, D. Right? 
B, A, E, D. This is the longest path between B and D. But now this is a problem that does not satisfy the optimal substructure in the sense that if we look at the longest path between B and A and the longest path between B and D, they're not going to give us the longest path between B and D. So longest path between B and A and longest path between uh, A and D. So if we try to break the problem of finding the longest path from B to D into two sub-problems, the problem of finding the longest path between B and A and the problem of finding the longest path between a and D, that's not going to work. Because what's the longest path between B and A? B, C, D. Yeah, B, C, D, E. Yeah, exactly. So this is B, C, D, E. And what's the longest path between A and D? A and yeah, A, B, C, D. So the point is, if you combine, if you take the longest path between B and A and combine it with the longest path between A and D, will you get the longest path between B and D? No, you will not even get a, a valid path because you will get lots of some vertices visited multiple times. So the point is, longest path Longest path, or we can just say that if we add this, if we concatenate this and this, we will not get this. If you concatenate the longest path between B and A to the longest path between A and D, you will not get the longest path between B and D. So this problem does not satisfy the optimal substructure, which means that you cannot construct solutions to bigger problems by solving subproblems optimally and then combining the solutions to the subproblems to construct solutions to the bigger problems. So this does not satisfy the optimal substructure property. Because you cannot solve the subproblems uh, separately and then combine solutions to subproblems to find solutions to bigger problems. So this problem does not satisfy it, but the activity selection does satisfy it. Why? Because it's a much simpler problem. So once I have made this greedy choice of selecting A1, if I solve this subproblem separately, there is nothing that prevents me from concatenating or combining the solution to the subproblem with A1, which is the greedy choice. So I combine the greedy choice with an optimal solution to the subproblem, and I get a solution to the big problem. Why is concatenation possible? Concatenation is possible because these activities here, I'm only considering the activities that start after A1 finishes. By definition, this is the subproblem. The subproblem is trying to select out of the activities that start after A1 finishes. So this solution is going to be valid. And also, it, it's going to be optimal. And to prove that it's optimal, it's a very simple argument. It's a very simple argument by contradiction. So assume that, assume that for the sake of reaching a contradiction, that uh, assume that this subproblem has a better solution than its solution in the overall solution. So suppose that there is a better solution for this subproblem than its solution in the overall solution. Now in that case, I can take that solution to the subproblem and concatenate it to the A1 or combine it with A1 because the key idea is that concatenation is possible. Concatenation is valid. Unlike this problem. 
here you cannot concatenate. You cannot concatenate this path and this path and get this path. So here concatenation is invalid. Here concatenation is valid. Because concatenation is valid, I can take an optimal solution to this and stick it or you know, paste it with A1 and get a, a solution to the bigger uh, problem, which contradicts the assumption that the big solution is optimal. So we are saying that there is an optimal solution to the big problem that has a suboptimal solution to this problem. This is a contradiction because if there was a better solution, I can stick it to A1 and get a better solution to the overall problem. Okay, so the key idea is concatenation. I can concatenate, I can cut and paste. So it's uh, basically this problem is so simple that I can just cut and paste. Unlike this complex problem. This is a harder problem where I, I can't just cut and paste. Okay, now that I can cut and paste, like I said, we can do this repeatedly. So I pick A1, I solve this problem separately, but in order to solve it, I repeat the same thing. I pick the greedy choice, and then I have a smaller subproblem, and then I pick the greedy choice, I get an even smaller subproblem, and so on. Okay, so I hope that it's clearer now. Okay, so one more thing. So last time, you know, we. So that's why you need the greedy choice property and the optimal substructure property. Now with the fractional knapsack problem, we said that, okay, this is an optimal solution that has these items, O1, O2, O3, OM, and if O1 is not equal to A1, I can replace part of O1 with A1, whether you know, A1 could be smaller or bigger, but whether it's smaller or bigger, if it's smaller, I can replace this part with A1 and get something better than uh, what I have. Or if, it, if A1 is bigger, I can just replace the whole thing with A1 because I can add any fraction I want. Now the question is, why doesn't this argument apply to the 0, 1 knapsack? So in order to understand that this argument is not just uh, uh, you know, a meaningless argument, why doesn't this argument apply to the 0, 1 knapsack problem? So I can say, okay, this is a, I'm assuming that I have an optimal solution that does not start with a greedy choice. It starts with O1, and A1 is the greedy choice. Can I just make the same cut and paste argument and apply it to the 0, 1 knapsack problem? No. Why not? Not necessarily. Yeah, exactly. So the point here is that if A1 is the greedy choice, O1 is the first element in the hypothetical, uh, you know, optimal solution. The, the optimal solution that I assume does not start with the greedy choice. If I replace O1 with A1, well, first of all, if A1 is bigger than O1 in weight, I will not be able to do the replacement. So the replacement is not always possible. If A1 has a higher weight, I will not be able to do the replacement. But even if A1 is smaller in weight, so if A1 is this, again, this replacement doesn't prove anything. Why? If A1 is smaller, Left yeah, exactly, because I have lost some space here, and this space may make the solution worse, right? So, yes, A1 is a more valuable item than O1. I replaced part of it with a more valuable item, but I left some space here, and then I, have, I may lose some uh, value. So, the, the overall value of O1 could be greater than, you know, the value of A1, which is more valuable, but I couldn't take the same amount of weight from A1. So that's why the cut and paste argument does not work on the 
zero one knapsack problem and the zero one knapsack problem does not satisfy the greedy choice property and you cannot solve it using greedy algorithms okay